Hello, I'm Steve Smith, President of Berkshire Choral International, and welcome to our Summer 2020 Virtual Faculty Recital. Now, before COVID-19 struck, we were looking forward to welcoming more than 500 choral singers to our singing weeks this summer in Lenox, Boston, Amsterdam, and Barcelona. And one of the highlights of each of those weeks for choristers would have been the faculty and apprentice recital, an informal chance for us to hear the great talent of the folks that work with us during our singing weeks. Since we can't be together in person this summer, eight of our former faculty and soloists have submitted tapes, uh, some from uh, previous public performances that they've made and some from home while they're in quarantine like the rest of us. Um, my thanks to each of them for being part of today's show. Frank and I have done short interviews with each of them to introduce each song. Um, so as we go along, you'll get to hear a little bit about them and what they're up to. For folks who have sung with BCI in the past, we hope this reminds you of more normal times, and we hope it brings a little bit of hope that we'll all sing together again as soon as possible. Now, if you're watching uh, this premiere with us uh, on YouTube, um, feel free to use the comment box. Uh, you can chat and say hello. And at the end of the recital, which will last about an hour, we'll post a link to a Zoom room and we'll all be able to say hello. Uh, Frank Nemhauser and I will say very brief words of welcome. And if all goes well, technically, we'll break into some rooms where you can briefly say hello to each other and, and catch up a little bit. So when it's safe to sing again uh, together, BCI will be ready to welcome you and everyone who loves to sing great choral music back to our programs. And over the coming months, we'll continue to create some content and learning opportunities that will help you to indulge your love of choral music and, and keep that toe in the water because your voice always belongs here at BCI. So thanks for joining us and on with the show. Okay. I'm here with Mark Malamot, who's part of our recital today. Mark, nice to meet you. It's great to be speaking with you right now. How are um, you? So tell me, how have you been taking care of yourself during the past few months? Well, my husband and I have a house in Kerhunkson, New York, in Ulster County, very rural. And uh, it's, been, it's been lovely to be here together. Um, it's definitely a different schedule that I'm used to keeping, but uh, I've been indulging in lots of cooking and lots of gardening. So that's been a lot of gardens that I've been wanting to, to develop and nurture. That's been coming to fruition. That's great. I've, I've done lots of the cooking part. Um, so if you, what's your favorite recollection you have from times that you've sung at BCI? I've sung, um, I've sung at BCI three times. Um, but I have to say, I think it had, it must be the Stephen Paulus's, um, to be certain of the dawn, which is a very moving Holocaust uh, remembrance piece. Um, I, there, it was called for four sol soloists and the role of the cantor, um, and that's the role that I took on. And um, it was moving. It, it was really a community effort. The, in, the wonderful chorus of BCI, a children's chorus, the four soloists, um, led beautifully by Kathy Salzman Romy, who knew, who, know, who knew this piece inside and out. It was the last time that I was able to perform in Sheffield, um, so that you know that took on a lot of significance as well. But it was it was a very moving it's a very moving work, and I was we were all fortunate that um, Stephen Paulus's wife was there, and I got to meet her. Um, he's really one of my favorite composers. Yeah, his music's great, and I didn't know that piece. We I listened to it online, and it's just wonderful. So it, it truly is great. Um, so you're singing Copeland today. Tell me a little bit about the selection. Well, the selection, it was, it was, it's a tune written in 1865, set by Robert Lowry, and Aaron Copeland set a, a solo song setting in 1952 uh, of this old American song uh, that was part of, it was the fourth song in his volume of old American songs. And um, I was actually asked originally to, to record this for my my church job in Manhattan at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church. And so my wonderful music director and accompanist, Andrew Henderson, sent me the recording of the, the accompaniment and I recorded my voice and then it was engineered, fused together as we're all, as so many singers are doing right now from their homes. Um, and, when, and when I was asked to be a part of this wonderful recital, 
I thought, well, this will be really fitting because it's a metaphor for being together, making music together. And I know we all need and want that so badly. So let's keep our eye on that and on, on, on beauty and optimism. Absolutely. I've been been joking with my team that that what we're the recital that we're doing is sort of our, our mini version of the Met Gala that was online this spring. So <laughs> that was amazing. That was really wonderful. Uh, great. So, Mark, thanks for being part of this today. It's my pleasure. So I'm here with Catherine Dane. Catherine, how are you and where are you? Hi, everyone. I am in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, where I live. And I am okay. Uh, like everyone else, I am um, from one minute to the next, distraught, happy for the break, worried about everyone, um, enjoying unexpected free time. Um, you know, I'm lucky, I'm feeling okay, and uh, the music industry is a catastrophe, but it's one day at a time, and I'm all right. Thank you. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad to hear that you're doing well, uh, yes. and as well as we can expect. Indeed. Right. Um, you've been associated with BCI for a number of years as faculty, as soloist. I wonder if there's... Um, uh, a memory or two that you'd like to share with us? Oh gosh, it's so hard to choose because there are truly so many. I was trying to think of which year I first worked for BCI, BCF then, and I think it might have been 2008. Um, it was a while ago and that was in Sheffield. And I remember working for four weeks and feeling so overwhelmed, I didn't know what to do <laughs> because it was so wonderful and so intense and the work was so hard and it was so rewarding. And um, I will never forget that first summer for sure. Since then, I've done a lot of the weeks abroad and there have been too many good memories to name. But last summer I was in Prague. It was especially beautiful singing the Dvorak Stavot Mater mm -hmm. with Heinz Fairlash, just so great. Um, other memorable summers were Skagino, 
I remember that summer I was soprano faculty and we were singing one piece that had four parts soprano divisi and I tried to sing all four parts at once as best I could. I managed some of the time. <laughs> yes, as Anna Russell once said, you know, I'm older now, so my part singing is not as good as it, as it used to be. <laughs> that was my pinnacle, I think, of my whole life. <laughs> well done. And um, you were singing uh, Debussy de Rêve for us, uh, de Rêve, I should say. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this piece and uh, what it means to you? Yes, it's a very, very beautiful song. It's one of Debussy's prose lyrique, which is a cycle that's not done that often. It's four songs. One of the special things about it is that it's the only time that Debussy himself undertook the writing of his own texts. So it's poems that he wrote, and you can really tell that he's trying for a complete synthesis of his musical and poetic ideas. And I think that the result is gorgeous. Um, it's quite a special um, situation with the performance of this song because I um, have been quarantined since March with a pianist that I met at Manus right around the same time that I met you, Frank, and in the same building. And um, his name is Sam Armstrong, and we became friends when we were both students. And uh, he ended up sort of sheltering in my house in Rotterdam, although he lives in Dublin now. And we have been working songs this whole time, just as a way of kind of continuing our music, having something to do. And it's ended up developing in a really beautiful way, this collaboration. It always was very good feeling and good chemistry and good musical result with us, but it's really deepened in this time. And that's something that would have been very hard to plan for in mm -hmm. normal circumstances. And it, there are precious few gifts of this time, but this is really one of them. And oh. now we're going to make a CD together as a result of the time. This will be on it. So this oh, is how wonderful. And, and you'll let us know and we'll, we'll tell everybody about the CD. It's wonderful. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing you sing. Thank you.
I'm here with Laura Strickland. Laura, how are you and where are you? Good afternoon. I live in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. How wonderful. What a beautiful background I see there. Yeah, we live right in front of Megan's Bay. So we've got all these yachts and, you know, <laughs> people slumming it and quarantining in, in poverty. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been there um, for the duration of the, of the quarantine? Yeah, so I was in New York working on an opera, Tom Chapulo's The Parting, and we were about a week into rehearsals, uh, and of course everything shut down, so I jumped on the next plane back to my home, and, um, you know, missed out on a fun production, but of course it was the right decision. Well, I'm glad you got out and got the tables out, so that's good. Uh, you've sung with us a number of times in Sheffield and in Ashland, uh, in uh, North Carolina and most recently in Boston. I wonder That's if there right. are any uh, BCI memories uh, that stick out for you that you care to share with us. Honestly, it's always the people because I feel like all the people who go to BCI are just so full of joy in music and community. And so the people are the things I remember the most, the individual conversations I've had. And a lot of times I have reconnected with BCI people in other cities. So I've gone out to dinner with people and choristers and, you know, other people that I've met at BCI. So it really is kind of this experience that just keeps going on and on and on because we really are a community. How wonderful. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. <laughs> How wonderful. Um, so you're about to sing a Rebecca Clark song for us. Can you tell us a little bit about the song? And also, you know, most of our singers will not be familiar with Rebecca Clark. I know, know her as a composer of viola music. Uh, right. Viola's. So tell us a little bit. Yeah, she was actually one of the first female orchestral instrumentalists uh, professionally. So um, in 1922, she wrote this song. Um, but, you know, she was an active composer of viola music her entire compositional career. But she also wrote, I think, you know, I, I don't remember the actual number, but it's a, a wealth of, of gorgeous songs. And this is my personal favorite. Um, but it's um, based on uh, A Mainsail Hall by John Macefield, the text. And people are always asking me what my favorite language to sing in is, because obviously as, as a classical singer, I'm asked to sing in German and French and Italian and Spanish and finish and, and the list goes on but you know I my favorite language to sing is English because it's my first language and so this song is a wonderful English British song but it's also a story and I love singing story I love singing narrative songs because I like taking people on a journey you know I, I have a four-year-old daughter and I like to open a book and and take her on that journey and and um, so at, when I sing a song like this it's kind of my chance to take an audience on that on that tale uh, story as well well wonderful so everyone please join us for the story and the tale of the seal man by Rebecca Clark thank you Lauren thank you
Well, I'm joined by Patrick Waters, who um, has a, a lot of history with BCI. Um, if I'm right, you've been a conducting apprentice, a faculty member, and a soloist. Um, how have you been faring during our, you know, now going on three or four months of social distancing? I desperately miss making music with other people. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel much the same way. And uh, it's just such a strange period, but I, hopefully we'll look back on it and uh, be more grateful when we're back to some version of normal. Yeah, I don't remember a time when I wasn't confined to my apartment, to be right. honest. It's a little <laughs> bit like, like being, uh, you know, your parents punishing you and put, you know, <laughs> stay in or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but we're all going through that. Right. So as you think back on some of the times that you've been with, with BCI, do you have a favorite experience or memory uh, that sticks with you? I have many, um, many of which I cannot share. <laughs> uh, the best. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, yes. Uh, but probably my, the one that means the most to me was from 2007 when I was a conducting apprentice. My friend, Chris Walters was the head apprentice at the time. And I remember him very, um, just very vividly. Uh, I, I, he's, he's a larger than life guy and he's a great friend. I haven't kept in touch with him as much as I should have, but um, there was a, a, an auction that the festival was putting on for choristers to conduct the orchestra. And somebody decided that they would um, put up and they would put up a bid, but instead of themselves going up to conduct, they would offer it to the apprentices. And uh, I remember I was sitting next to Chris as Frank had all the conducting apprentice names balled up in like little sheets of paper. And he was like, whichever one lands closest to my foot wins. And he threw them up in the air and I was, I, he picked my name and he didn't even say anything. He just looked and, and just reached out his hand and shook mine. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to do it. And it was the Beethoven choral fantasy, uh, which was an amazing experience um, because that's such, it's a big piece. It has a large orchestra, it's a pianist, and it has six soloists, although we were doing it with everybody that was on faculty. So it had eight soloists on stage. And it was so thrilling to conduct that uh, and to, to, to make music with the, the eight faculty members who at that point were, I, were my mentors, but eventually became colleagues. Yes. And to, and to conduct a pianist, a soloist, to conduct the orchestra, to conduct the chorus. I just remember it so very clearly and enjoying it so much and feeling that, that experience having, having meaning for me. It was just, it was an incredible experience. Oh, wonderful. I'm glad you had that, that opportunity. Yeah. So you clearly are a multifaceted uh, musician, and I think we often know you as a tenor. Uh, but today you're playing piano for us. I am, yes. I uh, about the Poulenc and why you chose it. Um, I just, I felt like I want to do something a little bit different. And this is a piece that I've had. Uh, I haven't actually had it in my fingers until very recently. I, I started looking at it back in 2004. Uh, and it's a beautiful piece of music that uh, it's, it's unlike a lot of other Poulenc because his music tends to be lighthearted and irreverent. So when he, what I think happened when he sat down to write this piece or improvise, he started to improvise something in, in 1939 or 1940, he was, he he felt he felt like there was so much going on in Europe that was dark and disastrous um, and catastrophic that he felt some need to write something beautiful uh, in sort of to go against the grain to to strike at the irony of the fact that he, that there was still beauty but there was such horror going on 
in the world. And I can just, I can just picture him sitting there at his piano with a cigarette in his hand, like occasionally just letting it hang out of his mouth and just laughing to himself at, at just sort of thinking of, ah, this is so beautiful and the world is so horrible. I can just see him doing that. <laughs> well, I will now have that image as we listen to you play it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Patrick. Well, thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Patrick Waters. I'm a tenor, and I've been working with Berkshire Coral International on and off for 14 years. Uh, the summer was going to be an exciting one for me. I was going to be in Lenox as a faculty member, and I was going to be a soloist in BCI's performance of Carmina Burana in Symphony Hall with Grant Gershon. That hasn't worked out the way we all wanted it to, but c'est la vie. Uh, speaking of French, decided to present a piano work by Francis Poulenc instead of singing something um, in acknowledgement of the other work that would have been performed uh, in Symphony Hall this summer, uh, Poulenc's Gloria. Poulenc was an early to mid 20th century French composer. And he, when he wrote this piece, uh, Melancholie, in 1940, you have to think about what was going on in Europe at the time. A lot of hatred, a lot of anger, a lot of violence against uh, marginalized peoples, and a lot of fear. Um, in my imagination, Poulenc wanted to draw on his own recollections of more peaceful times, even though he really came of age in the aftermath of World War I. Uh, this piece, like the name suggests, has a lot of depth to it, which is um, uncharacteristic for much of Poulenc's music. He would not disagree with me if I called the, his music trifles or inconsequential. Um, he, he had this sort of sardonicism to uh, to his music um, but it's not found in this music at all uh, at least on the surface if you think about um, the context of of a piece like this a beautiful luscious work being written during such strife you can imagine him um, sort of smoking a cigarette thinking eh. <laughs> just laughing to himself and thinking of the irony of writing a beautiful piece of work in the middle of such horror. Um, but it is beautiful and it moves me. And my hope is that the music moves you as well. Please enjoy it.
I'm here with Emily Mish. Hi, Emily. Tell us how you are and where you are. Um, I am doing just about as well as I could be. I'm down in Virginia. I usually live in New York, but I happened to be visiting my boyfriend down here when everything went kind of crazy. So a couple week trip turned into a three and a half month and counting trip. Um, but it's nice to be somewhere where there's a bit more space. Yes, I bet. Oh, good. Uh, you know, you uh, sang with us in um, Baller 8 in Sheffield and you were scheduled to sing with us again this summer of the Mozart Requiem. Um, I wonder whether you have any particular memory of your time with us in Sheffield that, you, that you'd like to share? Yes, so I think the really cool thing about Mahler 8, and specifically the part that I sang, Mater Gloriosa, is that I had the best seat in the house because I was up in a balcony for the entire thing, and I don't sing until right near the end. So I just got to sit up there and watch everyone and listen to everyone. And it's huge. You know, there's so many people on that stage. There's a full chorus, there's a full orchestra, there are the soloists. And I was just sitting up there watching it all happen. It was a really, really cool vantage point. Oh, wonderful. Well, we'll certainly have you back once we, once we get up and running. So just, yes, keep our fingers crossed. Now, tell us about uh, what you're going to sing for us, especially the Respighi, which I think will not be familiar to a lot of people. Yes, so these two pieces that are coming up are I Fauni from Deita Silvane, which means Forest Gods by Respighi, and uh, the second Queen of the Night aria, which is, yes, more commonly known. So um, the Respighi song cycle is these five songs about different gods in this sort of magical forest. Um, and in a way, it sort of goes from morning to night, like from, from youth to old age throughout the songs and like through the framework of looking at these different gods. So we found he sort of is the first song in the cycle and it starts with the forest waking up, you hear the fawns beginning to go about their activity, and you hear all these sounds, including Pan's flute, which culminates in uh, Pan chasing all of the nymphs out of the forest by the end of the song. As he is wont to do. As he is wont to do. That's, that's right. Good. And I think a lot of people will be familiar with the Queen of the Night, so it's, uh, that'll be a wonderful encore for us. Hey. So, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we look forward to hearing Emily sing. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Salte la verri, murmure giove per le fore. 
Pam, thanks so much for being part of our recital today. I'm delighted to take part in this. So we were chatting just before we started the recording. How have you been taking care of yourself the past few months as we've all dealt with uh, isolation? Well, um, one great thing was that um, my partner and I acquired a new cat in December. So she has been very entertaining and she's sort of kept our mood light. Um, <laughs> she, of course, loves the fact that we're home all the time. So she's not so crazy about all the computer work, though. Right. Uh, <laughs> when, we, when we resume normal, she'll have sort of a learning curve of being home alone for a while. I think so. I think so, yeah. <laughs> but, but I think I feel that way about myself, so. <laughs> right. So, um, I, you know, I've been asking folks that are singing for us, do you have a favorite memory or recollection from singing with BCI? You know, I'm so glad that you gave me some time to think about that because um, there are so many. And it's really, really hard to, to focus down. I mean, I find myself thinking over and over again about my fantastic colleagues. You know, I think of uh, Frank and his great sort of, you know, blue jokes that he would tell every year. Um, and I, of course, I remember Catherine McKeever and, and her beautiful spirit and, you know, the, the fact that um, she, we lost her far too young. But I, I think that um, in, maybe in a kind of a selfish way, my favorite memory was from um, some of the faculty recitals we used to give. And Greg Pernhagen, who, you know, was one of my favorite singers. He had such a beautiful artistry and incredible stage presence. And there was one where the two of us got into a contest who could sing more pianissimo, who could be um, more delicate and, and, you know, elegant and precious. We called it the pianissimo smackdown. <laughs> <laughs> and I just loved that. So that was my memory. You could have followed that up with your Ethel Merman, anything you can sing, I can sing softer. Softer, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. So I think you're singing Schumann for us today. Tell me about that selection. Yeah, um, which is actually kind of fits with what we were just talking about because part of this song requires that I use that beautiful soft singing. Um, this song, this the, the performance that you're going to hear comes from a recital that I gave in Tucson, Arizona with um, one of my dearest friends, Michael Manning, he's the pianist, and um, my partner, Roy Sansom, who you will see in the video, Turning Pages, um, he is a recorder player, and the three of us have been collaborating on these programs um, every summer for the past, oh, several, uh, like, I think it's coming on to eight years now. Mm -hmm. um, the song comes from a cycle by Schumann that's not as well known as his famous ones. It's Opus 90. Um, and I fell in love with these songs when I first discovered them. They're, they're so romantic and um, touching and incredibly expressive, which you'll hear in this song. Um, the, the poem talks about um, a rose that is withering from the heat of the summer and the poet is making a comparison between this flower and his beloved who seems to be withering from sorrow. And he says, I wish I could pour my soul out as a refreshing draft of water for you. Um, and you hear that tenderness and that longing in the, in the, in the beautiful long arching. You'll hear those absolutely romantic gestures of Schumann that are so appealing. Wonderful. We, we look forward to it. My pleasure. My pleasure. I'm so happy to share this with all of my friends at BCI. Great.
Well, I'm here with Melissa Atterbury. Melissa, thanks for taking time to chat with us this, today. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here with you. So um, tell me how you've been taking care of yourself during the health crisis of the past few months. Um, I get a lot of exercise. Um, that's kind of what's um, saved me. Um, the, the BCI members that will remember me know that I usually would spend a lot of time outdoors running and um, in the gym by the hockey rink um, when we were back on the Sheffield campus. And so um, I do, I, I spend a lot of time outside um, and um, we've mostly been spending our time in Vermont. So there's been a lot of hiking and running. And now that it's summertime, there'll be some water sports. Um, so a lot of time in nature. Excellent. Uh, I, I think that beats being stuck in, in the city. During Absolutely. The as much as I miss it. Um, so tell me, uh, from, from your past experience at BCI, what's a f uh, favorite uh, memory or moment that you can recall? So I, I thought about this a little bit um, because I have a lot of good memories so, and a lot of laughs and a lot of wonderful times um, uh, of my years at BCI. But I think I would have to say that it was during my second summer there, and that's the first time I got to re meet with um, and work with uh, Robert Page. Oh. Um, I had heard about him the entire summer before from all the choristers, from faculty, staff, and all the stories and what it was going to be like to work with him. And so I finally did get to then meet him in 2011 when we did Elgar's uh, The Music Makers. And it was such a pleasure to meet this legend <laughs> that I'd heard about, um, you know, for, um, for seasons before. And, um, you know, to 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 learn that you know really he was just a pussy cat you know and he was he was really such a dear you know he he had some rough edges but it was really nice to get to know him better and our um, professional friendship you know continued um, even past the BCI years and um, I was able to work with him in some other capacities and so that's a real treasure that I will hold on to you know in my music career that I got to really get to know him um, and learn all about him. That's why, you know, being new myself, I, I look at the roster of, of conductors that have worked with us over the years, and it, it's the who's who. So I'm glad you had that yes. experience. Um, so you're singing Handel today, uh, The Trumpet Shall Sound. Now I'm having flashbacks when I was a, a freshman in college, and this was one of the first arias assigned to me. So um, tell me how you came to this. Well, um, the performance that I'm sharing today is from 2018, and it was at the... Um, uh, Kaufman Center in Kansas City, Missouri, with the Spire Baroque Ensemble and conductor Ben Spalding. Um, and um, the conductor that year chose to switch around some of the traditional gender roles um, of Messiah. Um, now, this was not my first time doing this. Um, it was my first time singing that aria, but um, the previous year in 2017 um, at Trinity Wall Street, which is also where um, I'm an associate director of music, um, we, uh, kind of embarked on this, um, that we'd talked about it with, um, our conductor, Julian Walkner and members of the choir. And, and there had been a conversation for several years before about why not try something a little different with Messiah? Um, and so, you know, I've got to give a little credit to Julian for really leading the helm and trying this and making some different assignments. So, um, so I had already... I had a first go at this um, a year before singing the um, Why Do the Nations, which was also thrilling to sing <laughs> as a mezzo. Um, 
So, uh, and, and now I've been able to do a few different things. And, and you know, it's, it's nice to have seen that this has caught on a little, little bit with different ensembles around the country. And that also not only works like Messiah, but we've done Mom Vespers. Um, and I'm sure there are some other um, large major works out there that you might be able to think about you know, just from a different perspective and what, what that means and what that feels like. And um, as far as singing it, I, it was one of my favorite performances. When you guys asked me to submit something, I remember that it's one of my top 10 that I've ever done. Um, it, I just felt so much joy. It felt so good to sing that aria at the end of the long story. <laughs> and I get now why the baritones love it. Um, I mean, it is so thrilling to do, and you just feel all this joyful emotion that you're you're bringing this amazing message at the end of a of a you know a long story that had ups and downs. It just feels so good to be that um, the bringer of joy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I won't, yeah, I will never forget that being able to do that aria. Well, I look forward to hearing you singing it, and I'm glad I don't have to. Melissa, thanks for taking a moment. You are most welcome, Steve. Thanks. All right. Be well. You too. Thank you. 
I'm here with Christina Bacharach. Hi, how are you and where are you? I'm wonderful. All things considered, I'm doing okay. I'm in the um, suburb of Chicago, LaGrange, Illinois. Um, all things considered, doing well, grateful for the health of my friends and family, and actually the longest period at home in maybe 10 years. Oh my goodness. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but I'm really uh, missing my friends, family, colleagues, musical community. Yeah, that's one of the toughest parts of all this. So you've been involved with these guys in several capacities, faculty member, soloist, and several of our venues, Sheffield and Newport and Saratoga Springs. I wonder whether uh, there's a particular memory or two that uh, stick out for you? Gosh, so many. Um, and yet, I think what I miss the most is something that was present in every venue, which is the way that... Um, the community um, forms so quickly and so beautifully um, and the way that a group of people sort of get to know each other so intimately when working towards a common musical goal together. I really miss that. I miss breaking bread with everyone every day and yeah, just getting to know people as musical beings and as humans. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, fingers crossed we'll be back in business <laughs> yep. before you know it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the musical selection, Schoenberg, uh, one of the cabaret songs. Yes, uh, this is Aria aus dem Spiegel von Arkadien, which was originally conceived of as an aria for a longer piece, but ended up um, just being performed in a cabaret setting. And this is really an early Schoenberg. We think of him as an atonalist, as a serialist, but this was before that was even a twinkle in his eye. Um, he wrote these pieces essentially to make a buck to be performed at the Überbrettel Cabaret in Berlin. And interestingly enough, um, the larger piece that he was thinking, um, Spiegel von Arkadien, is a libretto by Emanuel Schickenader, who is the same guy who wrote the libretto for Mozart's Magic Flute and appeared as Papageno in said opera in the premiere. Um, and the character singing this aria is pretty similar to Papageno in that he's really all about the ladies. And the recurring theme in this piece is just a series of um, saying boom, 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 boom. And he's talking about uh, the way that women raise his heart rate. Aha, uh -huh, wonderful. <laughs> so can we consider this your Papageno debut? Yeah, absolutely. It's on my resume as such, yes. yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Well, everybody, <laughs> enjoy the wonderful singing of Christina Bachrach. Thank you so much. Much love to all. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> oh,